Hello and welcome to this edition of World at War. My name is Mohammed Saleh. Everything they say is fair in love and war. But think about it for a moment. Is it fair to drop bombs on hospitals, schools and even historic churches? Make no mistake about it, even wars have rules. And in this conflict that is unfolding at this moment, every rule of war has been flouted. In fact, war crime after war crime has been committed in the last fortnight. And arguably, the worst war crime of the century so far has been committed when the al Ahli Baptist Hospital that is managed by the Episcopal Church in Jerusalem was bombed, resulting in almost 500 casualties. The massacre has sparked international outrage. The Palestinians have blamed the Israelis for deliberately targeting and bombing the hospital. But Israel, after many retractions and versions of its defense claims that it was a broken fragment of a Palestinian Islamic Jihad rocket that fell in the hospital. But what really is the truth? A simple explanation of this war crime lies in the fact as to which side in this conflict has the firepower to inflict this level of carnage resulting in almost 500 casualties. Our next report gets you more details. This is the moment when a deadly explosion ripped through the parking lot of the Al Ahli Baptist Hospital in the Zaitun neighborhood of the Gaza city. You must hear the screech and then the devastating explosion. Almost 500 people who were taking refuge in the parking lot of the Al Ahli Baptist Hospital had their lives snuffed down. There were bodies splattered everywhere. And this is the single biggest massacre of civilians in one incident since hostilities broke out. The Israeli military has put out aerial images of the Al Ahli Baptist Hospital after it was targeted. The visuals of the bodies splattered everywhere in the aftermath of the devastating explosion are so horrific that we are consciously choosing to not show them to you. But we want to show you this scene from the Al Ahli Baptist Hospital just 20 hours before the deadly bombing. Full of children, women and the elderly who had taken refuge in the Christian hospital because their homes had been bombed in Israeli strikes. And many among these children are now said to have been killed in the bombing. But who is responsible for this? The Palestinians have squarely blamed Israel for the massacre. They say this hospital had been bombed before in the conflict as well. According to the World Health Organization, since the 7th of October, a total of 51 healthcare facilities, including hospitals, have been targeted. 15 healthcare workers have been killed, and over 27 healthcare personnel have been injured. Targeting hospitals, schools, and other places of refuge is a war crime. So what does Israel say about the Al Ahli Baptist Hospital bombing? Tel Aviv has blamed the Palestinian Islamic Jihad group, stating that a fragment from a rocket fired by the Palestinian Islamic Jihad had crashed into the hospital's parking lot, resulting in the fatalities. But questions have been raised about the credibility of Israeli assertions. When the Palestinian journalist Shirin Abu Akleh was killed last year, the IDF had first laid the blame on a bullet from a Palestinian militant, but six months later admitted that she was killed by an Israeli sniper. You must listen to this exchange at an IDF press conference over the hospital bombing. I'd also like you to address the question of credibility, because frankly the IDF has a less than perfect track record with the issue of credibility. Among other incidents, the Israeli government initially claimed that it was armed Palestinian militants who killed the journalist Shireen Abu Akleh, which we know is not true. So why should the world trust you now? Because of uh, the importance of credibility, and uh, in the past uh, we had uh, uh, our, uh, our, uh, our, ourselves were fast to go to conclusions. This is why in this event we took the time, took us more than five hours. We wanted to double check everything. Military experts are now pointing out that it was most likely the American manufactured JDAM that was used to bomb the Al Ahli Baptist Hospital. And for those who say why there is no big crater as would be expected in an Israeli airstrike, 
military experts point out to this version of the JDAM, the MK83 GBU-35. It explodes just above the ground surface, does not dig a big crater, but produces a huge fireball, shrapnel and devastating shock waves. Is this the weapon that was used to target the Al Ahli Baptist Hospital? Only an independent international investigation will be able to shed light on it. But the overarching question is this, does any Palestinian militant faction at this moment have this kind of firepower? Two Americans held captive by Hamas have now been released. The Palestinian faction Hamas has said that the mother-daughter duo were allowed to go on humanitarian grounds. And for the first time in over a fortnight, a handful of trucks of humanitarian aid have also been allowed to enter to the Gaza Strip from the Rafah border crossing. Human rights activists say that this is nothing more than a drop in the ocean. An estimated 2.3 million Palestinians in the Gaza Strip have been starved for almost about a fortnight with no access to food, water, medicines, electricity and other essential supplies. But is there a possibility of a de-escalation in this conflict? Well, not really. Because the indications that are coming in about what is unfolding at the moment are really dire. The possibility that this war will spread beyond the borders of Gaza is very real. The Americans aren't just pumping in more and more weapons and giving them to the Israelis to be dropped on the Gaza Strip. They've also stationed two of their biggest aircraft carriers and are sending an estimated 2,000 military personnel to Israel. The question is, what is the level of American involvement in this war? And also, what has sparked concerns amongst the American defense analysts are reports that at least about six Chinese naval vessels have been stationed in West Asia amidst the Israeli war. Our next port gets you more details. This is the Gaza city. Neighborhood after neighborhood has been reduced to rubble. And the local Palestinian people say these buildings were once full of civilians. And none of the civilians here had anything to do with Hamas. What has been bombed to smithereens aren't just people's homes, but everything that they owned, their life savings, their livelihoods, their dreams and their life. In another part of the Gaza city, an Israeli bomb has flattened a building. As the rescue workers pull out the bodies from under the rubble, it becomes clear that the entire Abu Akhra family has been killed in this attack. While they were sleeping, the strike hit them. Innocent children, with their father and grandmother, were hit while they were sleeping with an airstrike. What did they do? Did they carry weapons? These are innocent children who know nothing. Tell us when will this end? We've been in a war for years and people are just watching. Those Palestinians who managed to stay alive in the Israeli onslaught say that they are just lucky. And the Americans are pumping in more and more weapons into the conflict. There are even reports that the United States is sending artillery shells to Israel that were originally meant for Ukraine. And amidst this mayhem, there's been the first glimmer of hope. Two American women, 51-year-old Judith and a teenage daughter Natalie Ranan, have been released by Hamas on humanitarian grounds. For the first time in a fortnight, the Rafa border crossing opened briefly. A handful of trucks filled with humanitarian aid were allowed to pass through, and immediately afterwards, the Rafa crossing was again bombed. American leadership is what holds the world together. The American involvement in this war is continuously increasing. American values. 2,000 American troops have been put on deployment alert and they would be involved in support roles such as medical assistance and handling explosives. The United States has also vetoed a United Nations resolution calling for a humanitarian ceasefire in the Gaza Strip. Well, America's U.S.'s Gerald Ford Carrier Strike Group and U.S.'s Dwight Eisenhower Carrier Strike Group have been rushed to Israel's assistance and to warn off any state or non-state actors from getting involved in the conflict. 
But reports of six Chinese warships in West Asia amidst this bruising war backed by the United States has caused a lot of concern. It is not clear why the Chinese warships are lurking in these waters. But China's recent clear stance blaming the United States for the crisis in West Asia for backing the Israeli war in Gaza is raising a lot of concerns in Washington. But away from the cynical geopolitics and muscle flexing, the common Palestinians in the Gaza Strip are praying for peace. At this Orthodox Christian church in Ramallah, the pastor has a clear message. Our message to the world is to end this war that is causing devastation to the Gaza Strip, which resulted in the deaths of innocent Palestinian people. Peace will be established only when a Palestinian state exists which will help spread freedom and justice among everyone. Today, the Palestinian people in Gaza are suffering, and we offer our prayers to end this suffering and this war and destruction. The unprecedented audacious attack launched by the Palestinian militant faction Hamas on the 7th of October was described by the Hezbollah as a decisive response to Israel's continued occupation. Since then, deadly skirmishes have been witnessed on Israel's north border with Lebanon. These border skirmishes have raised the prospect of a broader conflict in West Asia. Fears of another front opening up in the north have progressively grown, especially in anticipation for ground incursion on the Gaza Strip by Israel. So what really is Hezbollah and why are they standing in solidarity with the Palestinians? Our next report explores the origins and also the journey so far of this Lebanese faction. Hezbollah or Hizb Allah is an Arabic term that translates to party of Allah or party of God. It's a Lebanese Shia Islamist political party and militant group. Formed in 1982 after Israel's invasion of Lebanon, it emerged from the armed groups formed by Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Even the name Hezbollah, adopted from the outfit, was chosen by the leader of the 1979 Iranian Revolution, Ayatollah Khomeini. Since 1992, the group has been led by its Secretary General, Hassan Nasrallah. In 2021, Nasrallah claimed that Hezbollah had 100,000 trained fighters. Often dubbed a state within a state, it is one of the most influential political blocs in Lebanon's sectarian political system, which is immensely popular among the Shia population. So far as its funding is concerned, the United States estimates hundreds of millions of dollars are allocated by Iran annually. A sustained campaign against Israeli forces in Lebanon culminated in Israeli forces withdrawing unilaterally from southern Lebanon in 2000, thereby prompting Hezbollah claims of being the first Arab army ever to force Israel to cede control of territory. Highlighted in its manifesto, its objectives include defeating Israel and expelling Western colonialist entities from the Middle East. Israel continues to occupy Syria's Golan Heights and Palestinian territories captured in the six-day 1967 Arab-Israeli war. Though they are separate entities, Hezbollah and Hamas share the common objective of armed resistance against Israel. A Palestinian group, Hamas politically controls the Gaza Strip, a territory of about 365 square kilometers, home to 2.3 million people. Since 2007, Hamas has been in power in the Gaza Strip, which is blockaded by Israel. The Hamas movement was founded in 1987 in Gaza by a wheelchair-bound Imam, Sheikh Ahmad Yassin, and his aide, Abdul Aziz al-Rantisi, shortly after the start of the first Intifada, or uprising against the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territories. Following October 7th Hamas attack, Hezbollah released a statement saying that it was closely monitoring the situation and was in direct contact with the leadership of the Palestinian resistance. Furthermore, Hezbollah said that the unprecedented attack was a decisive response to Israel's continued occupation and a message to those seeking normalization with Israel, a reference to the Arab countries. 
The leaders of Hezbollah and Hamas had also met in 2020 to discuss the normalization of relationship between Israel and the Arab countries. Hezbollah has been designated as a terrorist organization by the United States and the US allied Saudi Arabia. European Union classifies Hezbollah's military wing as a terrorist group, but not its political wing. The group continues to hold major sway in Lebanese politics. Since October 7, Hezbollah has traded cross-border fire with Israel numerous times, but stopped short of infiltrating deeper. How potent will be the threat posed by Hezbollah if it enters the Israel-Hamas war in a full-fledged manner? Well, given the fact that Hezbollah is much closer to a regular army, boasting a considerable rocket arsenal and even tanks, than merely a terror organization, the challenges posed by it will be far more potent. A reportage on war that almost resembles war propaganda has real-life consequences. A 71-year-old Illinois man stabbed a 6-year-old Muslim boy to death. The shocking, harrowing attack in which the boy's mother was also grievously wounded took place on the 14th of October. Charged with hate crimes, the assailant, who also happens to be the family's landlord, reportedly targeted the Palestinian-American family for their Islamic faith. And as a response to the war that at this moment is unfolding between Israel and Hamas after watching reports about this war on television. The question that needs to be asked is this. How responsible has the media coverage of this war been? And what is their liability for hate crimes such as this that are being committed after people watching a reportage of the war on their television and social media? Our next report gets you more details. Plainfield Township, about 40 miles southwest of Chicago, transformed into a scene of horrific murder last Saturday morning. Wadia Al Fayumi, a Palestinian American boy who celebrated his sixth birthday barely weeks ago, was stabbed 26 times with a military style knife with a 7 inch serrated blade. Wadia's mother, 32 year old Hanan Shanin, who came to the United States 12 years ago, endured multiple stab wounds in the attack. Expected to survive the attack, she couldn't attend her son's funeral as she is still recovering in hospital. The deceased boy and his mother had been living in two rented rooms in a house owned by the attacker, 71-year-old Joseph Zuba. There were no signs of anything wrong between the perpetrator and the victims. Zuba had been friendly to the whole family, but especially to the kid. The boy who he ended up killing had been like a grandson to him, a fact illustrated by gifts and toys that Zuba bestowed upon the kid. Zuba had even come for the boy's sixth birthday a few weeks ago. So what brought about this transformation and rage that ended up in the murder of the beloved kid? Reportedly, Zuba had been listening to the conservative talk radio since the Israel-Hamas conflict broke out. Increasingly paranoid about the presence of Palestinian Americans in his house, he was angry at the boy's mother for what was happening in Jerusalem. Finally, on the fateful morning, he attacked the boy's mother, attempting to choke her, saying, you Muslims must die. To what extent was this person radicalized and brainwashed by this lopsided, one-sided atmosphere that has fanned the flames of hatred against Muslims and Palestinians? And just as the families of these Palestinian American citizens back in Gaza and in Palestine are suffering from what is now being called war crimes, blanket bombings, etc., and this boy and his family who sought refuge in the United States have now been stabbed. One is killed and one is in serious condition. We fear for her life. And I was talking to the father and he mentioned that, you know, part of the reason we came here is to escape the subtler violence in which situations like this could occur with impunity. Zuba has been charged with first-degree murder, attempted first-degree murder, aggravated battery with a deadly weapon, and two counts of hate crime. The horrific, unprecedented incident has shocked the local community, now engulfed with a sense of paranoia and insecurity. It's heartbreaking. And again, it's because it's in this community. He had nothing to do with it. 
Oh, because he was an innocent child. He was Muslim. That's what happened. He was Muslim, and this is what they did. This is what this monster did. It hits home. You don't feel safe now? I live in Plainfield for over 20 years. You don't feel safe. I don't feel safe. I, someone on Facebook, literally, I was going after me right now, calling me a terrorist. So who's to blame for such a senseless, hateful, horrible act? Is it only the perpetrator of the crime or the wave of disinformation and toxicity we are enveloped with, inflaming passions and thereby escalating the conflict in an electronic fog of war? Close to 4,500 lives have been lost in the Israel-Hamas conflict so far. Introspection, a little empathy and restraint might save loss of many more. The conflict in West Asia has grabbed the global headlines for the last two weeks. The worldwide incessant coverage of the conflict has somewhat pushed the Russia-Ukraine war to the fringes of public consciousness. But the war trudges on, one horrific day at a time. The much-touted Ukrainian spring counteroffensive hasn't yielded the results that were desired by the Ukrainians. And now, the Russian troops have launched a major offensive on the strategic eastern Ukrainian city of Avdivka. Considered a symbol of Ukrainian resistance since 2014, the Ukrainian soldiers defending Avdivka are now bracing for a massive Russian attack. Our next report gets you more details. The frontline city of Avdivka is considered a gateway to Moscow-held Donetsk, the capital of Ukraine's eastern Donbas region. It lies just 15 kilometers from Donetsk and has turned into a major prestige battle. It is a symbol of Ukrainian resistance since 2014, when it had fallen, albeit briefly, to Russian-backed separatists. Although Russia and its proxy forces have occupied Donetsk city since 2014, they have not been able to use its resources as a key military communications hub because of its proximity to the front line. By capturing Avdivka, the Russian troops could further push the front line. To this objective, dozens of Russian tanks and armoured vehicles had advanced on the city on the morning of 10th October. Supported by artillery fire and bombardments from helicopters Please. and planes, but failed to break through. Reportedly, Russia lost at least a battalion tactical group's worth of armoured vehicles in offensive operations around Avdivka. Ukrainian soldiers defending the frontline city are now bracing for another massive attack. We should expect the second wave of the offensive. We know that the Russians have gathered a huge amount of reserves, both manpower and military equipment. Avdivka could be massively attacked again. Of course, the Russians can move these reserves to Marinka or Vohledar, but I think that Avdivka will be the priority and will be hit. Built around a huge coke plant, Avdivka had a pre-war population of around 30,000, which has dwindled to merely 1,600 now. The city centre narrates a tale of destruction as large blocks of buildings have been partially or fully destroyed by daily Russian artillery shelling and a bombing campaign that has continued unhindered since March this year. Of those who remain, they live permanently in basements and the delivery of humanitarian aid has also been disrupted since October 10. Due to the mass shelling, the delivery of humanitarian aid has been stocked for some time because volunteers are at great risk of being killed. But those stocks of food, water, medicines, hygiene items that have been accumulated in basements, the military administration has accumulated stocks. There will be enough for a month for sure. Though the Russian assaults have been mostly foiled and Ukraine still maintains control of the only access road to the city from the north, for how long can they withstand the Russian assault given their inexhaustible human resources? And with us, the wrap on this edition of World at War. And if you want to reach out to me with any comments, feedback or suggestions, 
feel free to do so on the RD that you're looking at on your screens. I'm your host, Mohammed Saleh, and I'll see you again next week.